What a nice turnout. So, hey everyone, my name is Dama Lucca, and today I want to talk to you a bit about explainable AI and the work that I've been doing over the past couple of months. So, like she said, I am a member of Knox Medical's research team, and in this great team, uh, we research and develop machine learning solutions. And these solutions are sometimes developed into tools that have a real impact on people's lives. <laughs> the tools we develop are diagnostic tools for the medical industry, namely for sleep experts and sleep technicians. So what you're looking at here on the slide is a frontal electroencephalogram. And this is essentially measuring electrical activity in your brain. It's measured with these little electrodes that you sleep with on your forehead. And each of these lines is the uh, referenced electrical activity between a pair of these electrodes. So sleep experts use this and they study this to see what's going on in your sleep and to determine whether your sleep is healthy. Um, it takes actually a lot of practice and work to get good at this, and it takes a lot of work to do just one sleep study. What you're looking at is 30 seconds of a recording. If you sleep for eight hours, that means that a human being has to look at 960 of these pages to see what's going on in your sleep. So that's why it's important to us at Knox Medical, and especially in Knox Research, to develop these tools that can make experts' lives easier by minimizing the amount of manual labor that they have to do. And we do that often by making these machine learning models that suggest what may be going on in order for them to review this faster. So what kind of models are we making? Well, a lot of the ones that we're working on right now are a specific type of neural network called a convolutional neural network which sounds kind of scary, but it's really not that bad. So the part of the network on the slide that's labeled feature learning, that's actually the convolutional part of the network. And feature learning is really you know, on point for this, because what this actually does is that it learns to detect features and patterns in the input image. So let me give you an example. The input is often an image into these networks. They're very much used in computer vision, for example. So an example of an input could be this picture of a charming man sitting at a computer. And the network works by performing an operation called a convolution between the input and the layer's filters. Now, the output of this is a map of where that filter was activated by something in the image. So in the lower layers of this kind of network, we expect these filters to be picking up on things like edges or colors. And then it outputs where it detects these things. And that's fed into the next layer below. And that layer looks at the features detected below it and detects feature like uh, patterns in those features. So it might say, for example, these edges make up a certain shape, or these colors make up a certain texture. And so as we travel through the network, we kind of see more higher and higher level things. Like, for example, we could have head detectors, or as we travel even farther down into the network, we discover features that are most useful for whatever task the network's network was trained to do. For example, if it's detecting certain people, it might detect people lower in the network. You might be asking yourself, OK, it's cool for pictures, but why are you using this on biometric signals? <laughs> and that's a very fair question. And the answer to that is really that we are able to do, or like our data exhibits a lot of the same properties that allow us to use these kinds of networks effectively. For example, in our data, we have lower level features like different wavelengths and amplitudes and other attributes like skewing. And these features combined make up higher level features that represent events in the brain and such. For example, we have here a uh, 
K-complex, which is believed actually to be your brain responding to some stimulus and trying to keep you uh, asleep. Instead of waking up, if you kick your leg, you might see a K-complex instead of you waking up and from sleep. And these are um, sharp spikes followed by sharp dips or sharp dips followed by sharp spikes. Uh, another higher level feature is what we call sleep spindles, and these are short bursts of very high frequency activity. But what is perhaps most important is that a convolutional neural network basically uses the same things, the same filters, to detect things in an image no matter where it is. So for example, a network would use the same things to detect a cat, whether it's here or here. And in the same way, we benefit from being able to detect K-complexes, whether they're here or here, without having to learn what a K-complex means at different positions or something like that. OK, so we've made a couple of these tools, and we're very proud of them, but they are tools. And to use a tool, you actually have to trust it. You have to believe that it'll do what it'll do. And for you to trust something, you need evidence that it can be trusted. And that evidence can be different things. It could be experience that a tool has gained. It could be an authority saying that it passes some criteria. Or it could be, like in the case of a hammer, you just kind of look at it and you <laughs> know how it works. But we're not really making a hammer. <laughs> what we're making is closer to an intelligent helper. And when you have, say, a human helper, and you don't necessarily immediately trust what they're saying, your first response, if you're rational, should be to ask them, why? <laughs> and that's exactly what I've been trying to do over these past couple of months. But the typical approach to ask um, a black box model why, actually, hold on, yeah. So the reason we want to ask it why. So a convolutional neural network, the type of network I just talked about, is what we consider to be a black box model. The actual mechanics of what happened inside the model, I mean, I can simplify them and say that there's features being detected, but the math behind it is very complicated. Um, the why is really because I looked at a bunch of data and I learned these parameters. And for deep neural networks, that can often mean, you know, hundreds of thousands of parameters. And that's a lot. A human isn't going to be able to read anything valuable from that. So what's typically done to provide evidence for these kinds of models is to evaluate them on some kind of data that the model hasn't seen before, using some metric, like accuracy or another performance metric. But when we consider this, does this accurately reflect how the model is going to do once you ship it? Does 99% accuracy on a model mean that the model is going to be right 99% of the time? when you release it into the world? Well, sometimes, yes. But when you assume that this is the case, what you're also assuming is that the data that you tested on is the same kind of data that it's going to see in the real world. <laughs> and that is, unfortunately, not always true. <laughs> All right. So performance measures like accuracy aren't really going to cut it. So what can we do? Well, when you have a black box model, what you do is you feed it some input, like a picture of a cat, and you get an output that say, uh, this is a cat. And when you want to explain this, you make an explainer model that takes in all three of these things and gives you an explanation. That sounds pretty ideal. But remember I told you that the black box model can be hundreds of thousands of parameters. So we really can't explain in a human readable way 
the exact dynamics that happen. So we need something simpler. We need the explanation model to provide something that a human can understand. And one of the approaches to doing this has been to look at the inputs and try to answer the question, OK, what part of this input did you use to come up with the answer? And also, secondly, did this part of the input have a positive effect on the answer or a negative one? So that's something that's much more easy for a human to understand. And of course, it doesn't really fully capture what's going on inside the model. Unfortunately, that's something we have to give up in order uh, to be able to do this. But being able to receive any kind of um, explanation at all, if you see that the model is looking at something that you think is reasonable, you're more inclined to believe it, even though it may be disagreed with you as an expert. For example, this is actually a really nice example. Uh, if you ask a model, why is this a meerkat, and why isn't this a mongoose? This is for all my mongoose and meerkat enthusiasts. It does make sense that it highlights uh, the eye and snout area, because that's where the main visual differences really come from. OK, so let's get a bit into how this works. I'm not going to get too technical. But to actually do this, there's a lot of proposed methods. This is a very active field of research. And I'm not really going to describe any one method specifically, but they do kind of naturally break down into two groups. So the first group is called like uh, gradient-based methods. So these operate by doing kind of the same thing that a model does when it's learning. So when a model learns, it uses something called backpropagation, which again, sounds kind of scary. But what it essentially does is that it propagates the blame for something backwards through the network. And when we're training, what we propagate back is the blame for the error that was made. And we use it to fix whatever error was made. Cool. But when we're explaining stuff, we can also propagate the blame for the output itself back onto the input. It's kind of sneaky. Um, this is reasonably loyal to what you know the network does, but the kind of interactions between the input are, of course, very complicated. And these methods do lead to stuff that can be somewhat hard to interpret. And that's really where we move on to with the second group of methods, which are called perturbation-based methods. And these are very interesting. They work by changing the input slightly and measuring how the changes in input affect the output. Um, these do give us smoother explanations often very smooth. But the problem is that with these methods, you have to calculate for many, many inputs what the output is. So they become very quickly extremely computationally expensive. And one other kind of issue with these is that the inputs that are generated through this slight change are not always very realistic. So it's kind of outside, again, what the model has actually learned to do. And it's less meaningful, in a way. So there's really no perfect method. There's flaws. But there is still value in this. It is valuable for, say, example, a sleep technician to be able to see what it is in a 30-second piece of recording that a neural network looked at. Instead of just getting a label, oh, this is some sleep stage, or I see this kind of activity here, it can highlight what it is that the network's looking at. And the thing kind of about this um, that makes it valuable is that when we think of sleep science, three, like the same period can get classified or uh, scored three different ways by three different sleep technicians. So experts don't always agree, because the things 
that they are trying to identify are very often loosely defined because this is very complicated. Our brain's not simple. Uh, so it does matter that an expert is able to get evidence that the network is not absolute garbage, even though it disagrees with it. All right. <laughs> so attribution-based methods and these kinds of local explanations are very important for the end user to be able to say, OK, I got this because of that. But it doesn't really tell us much at all about how the network builds its understanding or how the network functions globally. And again, for the end user, this is not as important. But if you're a machine learning engineer, this is something you might want to look at in order to see if maybe your model is using undesirable features or to discover that you can optimize your model in some way. So one way to do this is to just take a data set and run it through the model and see for maybe the outputs and some different filters what actually activates them the most. And this gives you stuff that's actually really easy for a person to look at and understand. But again, like with all of these methods, there's some cons as well. So this is limited by the data set. So if you choose a data set that's not real, same kind of issue as with the performance metrics. And the other thing is that it can show you parts of pictures, but it doesn't really tell you what it is about these parts that are so interesting. And that's where we kind of come to the next method, <laughs> which is called activation maximization. And this is actually very interesting. So I talked a little bit about backpropagation earlier and how you can propagate you know, blame for something backwards through a neural network. And activation maximization works by starting with some input, often random, but not always. There's some different methods. and all kinds of cool stuff you can read up on. But the kind of premise of it is, it is that you start with an input, and you run it through the network, and you get some output. And you say, well, OK, this isn't what I want to see. So you tell it that you want it to give you some other output. And you run through this, OK, and then, yes, you propagate the blame for that back. And then you run it through this loop a bunch of times until you get something that maximizes, say, the this is a fox output. And you can see what the neural network kind of believes a fox to be. So this doesn't reflect any one single sample, but it does show us in some way how the neural network builds its understanding. However, <laughs> you will notice that these images are, in large part, high-frequency noise. And we are, in essence, seeing machines. We're really good at using our eyes and our brain to filter out the visual information that we get. So just like the network, we can maybe see the fox in there somewhere. We can see some fox stuff, maybe some ears or a fur texture. but. This already kind of looks like high-frequency noise <laughs> to a non-expert. So for our purposes, starting with noise and pushing it in the direction of something might not be the best solution. Fortunately, you don't always, like it doesn't have to be this way. <laughs> so there's actually some very recent research uh, that's been done into, instead of active, like doing activation maximization on the input itself, instead of optimizing the input that goes into the network and getting all this high frequency noise and these artifacts, you instead optimize something, some kind of encoding that describes like what, the, what should be in the input, and then you generate the input through another neural network. And through this, you get inputs that are 
much less noisy, and you could get something like for our data that you can actually read and that an expert would be able to read more clearly. So we've talked a little bit about some explainability methods that can be applied to black box models after you've made them, but they all have one problem. Like, they have problems, obviously, of their own, but they all have one problem in common, which is that none of them fully describe what the model is actually doing. And the only way to really achieve that is to have the model explain itself. Simple models do this, like this sphinx cat decision tree. If you get the output, this is a sphinx cat, that's because it meowed and it had hair. <laughs> you don't need any kind of feature attribution to see that, and you also don't need any kind of global explanation, like um, activation maximization to see what it, what it does and how it works. I think even non-machine learning people could pretty easily understand what's going on here. So that's why I'll kind of always advocate for going for simpler models, if you can at all. If you have features that work for these and you don't gain anything significant by using a black box model, I would always pretty much go with something like this instead. But there's a big if in there, which is if you have features that work with stuff like this. And simple models just really don't cut it for some types of data. For example, computer vision, unfortunately. But that's not really the end of it, because there's, again, a very recent um, uh, development, which uh, is research into explainable models explicitly for computer vision data. So this is very interesting. This is the Proto PNET, which is uh, suggested by some researchers at Duke. And it operates very similarly to a convolutional neural network in that it uh, calculates these features, but it's restricted in the final layers to have features that are actually image patches. So when it tells you something is a bird, it also tells you, well, I think so, because I saw something that looks like this and then you can see that's a beak. You can see the little tummy and the wings and the scaly little legs and kind of understand why the model did what it did. Now, unfortunately, these methods kind of are, or this method is missing some of the bells and whistles that are, you know, make our current models great, but this is really good news for those of us who make, uh, you know, uh, solutions for high stakes situations. And on that note, we always need to be able to produce evidence for the systems that we create, evidence that show that they can be trusted. Trusting a tool makes it more easy to adopt, but trusting a tool for the wrong reasons can be plain dangerous. So we, as machine learning engineers, um, should be aware that shipping black box models can be risky if you've made assumptions about how everything works uh, and how the data that it will be used on is distributed. Um, having some way for the end user to get evidence of some kind is crucial in a lot of situations. And yeah, it's very important for us to consider these things when we're making stuff that we need to explain the things that we do. All right, thank you.